such a good dog. What good? Good dog. Welcome to River Road Farm. I am Rachel Page Elliott, and this is where many of the dogs were photographed that you're going to see in this film program on structure and gait. Our family moved into this old farm in 1946, and since that time, it has been the site of horse shows, dog shows, field trials, and even sled dog races. I began showing in obedience and dog shows in 1939 with a German Shepherd dog. But it was my husband's interest in duck hunting that led us to Golden Retrievers, and we've had a few of these every year since that time. Our dogs have earned degrees in obedience trials, championship titles in dog shows, and we've competed successfully in field trials. I've always been interested in the anatomy and structure of horses and dogs, and in the mid-50s, I began taking slow-motion movies to satisfy my own curiosity. This study developed into a fascinating hobby and eventually became a worldwide lecture career. And as I traveled around, I found a very strong bond among all those who love dogs. Because I received many requests for written material based on my lectures, I decided to write a book, and I did. It was published in 1973, called Dog Steps, Illustrated Gate at a Glance, with diagrams taken from some of the frames in the movie film itself. In 1983, ten years later, I updated the material in a second edition called The New Dog Steps, to include some very exciting research in bone and joint motion that I had done at Harvard University's Museum of Comparative Zoology. This was cineradiography, a method of fluoroscoping and photographing dogs as they move on a treadmill. And the study opened my eyes as to what really goes on inside a dog. And you're going to see some of this cineradiography in the movies that follow. The purpose of this program is to illustrate some of the features that lend quality to a dog's overall conformation and to his performance, and also some of the physical virtues and faults that can help or hinder his ground-covering ability and serviceability. It isn't necessary, really, to know the name of every bone and muscle, but it is important to try to visualize the action of the bones and muscles beneath the coat. We can't assess working ability in the show ring or temperament, but we can look for the traits that will help a dog to meet job requirements if he is asked to do so. It is an ongoing study with many variations. As we become familiar with the different varieties of dogs, some of ancient origin, others more recently developed, we gain more insight into the breeds of our own choice. And while we know that dogs all share common principles underlying the mechanics of locomotion, we must recognize the fact that gating styles vary according to shape, size, and purpose. The Borzoi, for example, is a graceful aristocrat, elegant yet strong, with a slim body, deep rib cage, and long legs a hound bred for quick bursts of speed. This subject shows a desirable outline, a correct set on of neck, well-muscled arch over the loin and gentle tuck up beneath. His trot is floating and effortless. Dogs built for speed cannot be asked to gallop in the show ring, but one should nevertheless look for the qualities that would contribute to usefulness afield. A skillful judge will examine a dog carefully and observe gait from every angle. For better analysis, most of the following studies have been filmed in slow motion. From a relaxed trot, this borzoi breaks into an easy canter, a three-beat gait in which there is one diagonally paired footfall on each complete stride. It is not nearly so fast as the four-beat double suspension gallop, where the body is airborne twice during each full stride. 
Nature has designed each joint and muscle to serve a special purpose. Flexibility of the spine enables the rear limbs to reach way forward beneath the body as the ball and socket action of the hips lets the knee joints swing wide to avoid interference with the ribs. Note how the shoulder blade has dropped back as far as the muscles will allow. The upper arm acts as a lever in helping to lift the blade as it swings from its upper edge against the withers. The greater the speed, the more the limbs converge to maintain balance and facilitate propulsion. A Rhodesian Ridgeback is another example of this principle. In contrast to the fleet of foot is the lumbering bulldog, originally bred for stability to withstand being bowled over by heavy-headed bulls. His unique conformation with wide shoulders and low-slung body gives him a characteristic role in slight sidewise movement. Free, high-stepping action with good drive distinguishes the tiny Italian greyhound. There is a natural tendency in all dogs for the limbs to converge to balance the body over a central support. Many dogs single track, like this, with all feet landing on or close to or center line. Others move with a wider footfall. Despite his wide body and short legs, the little Welsh Corgi has a sturdy gait and quick reactions that make him a good dog to have on the farm. Draft work and other tasks fall to the firmly muscled Rottweiler. This dog's driving force is transmitted directly and smoothly from strong hocks and stifles through the back into the forehand. How can we tell if these pups will be good working dogs? One of the essentials is an inherent desire to work. Although it is their first encounter with cattle, these Australian shepherds instinctively surround and hold this small herd. Sound structure is important for lasting job performance. This fine Aussie sets well into himself. The neck merges gradually into the withers, and good breadth across the forequarters indicates desirable layback of the shoulders. This is counterbalanced by a similar slope to the upper arms, which places the elbow correctly against the chest wall. There is also good width across the thighs telling of strong hindquarters. The overall picture is one of symmetry and balance, each end capable of doing its share of the work. Length of bone and relationship between the scapula and humerus determine the placement of the elbow against the chest wall. The setting varies with different kinds of dogs. It affects the way they move and may be right or wrong within members of the same breed. The center diagram depicts a front that is typical of many working dogs, retrievers, or spaniels. On the left is a fore assembly designed primarily for speed, with a wider angle at the shoulder joint, a sharply descending humerus, and elbow set well below the sternum. To the right is the achondroplastic type of structure, with the foreshortened, somewhat crooked bones, such as found in the Basset, the Bulldog, or Dachshund. Of course, there can be many variations. The chest capacity of a dog's central body depends on the precise shape and size of the spinal vertebrae, which determine spacing between the ribs, length of rib cage, and placement of the shoulders. This is a general anatomical diagram showing a good relationship of the bones one to another, with the scapular and pelvis in average normal position. The first three or four ribs are quite vertical and flat because they are the main support of the trunk 
and provide a smooth gliding surface for the blades. While rear wood, the function of the more curved ribs is for breathing expansion and housing vital organs. Between the last ribs and the pelvis is the loin area, usually referred to as the coupling. Shoulder lay back, that is, the angle of the scapula, can be determined by feeling along the scapular spine that runs up the center of the blade and normally concurs with the apex of the second of the spinous processes or withers. However, shoulder placement may vary slightly either forward or rearward at this point depending on shape of the rib cage and the fact that muscles are never stable. Slope of the pelvis may also vary depending on quality of conformation and breed type. But when balance structure combines with desired angulation and a firm top line, the stage is set for maximum mobility and efficient ground covering action. In the beautiful movement of this German Shepherd dog, energy forces are directed straight forward through stifles, loins, and central body into the shoulders. The trot is considered the best gait for showing coordination and the relationship of the bones one to another. The shoulders of this dog jar and pound. The back roaches and his body twists as the rear feet step to one side or the other to avoid hitting the front. He often paces, the lateral gait in which the legs on the same side move together. Confirmed by X-ray, this dog was afflicted with severe hip dysplasia, one of numerous bone diseases that can cause gaiting irregularities. Whatever the reason, pacing is unacceptable in the American show ring. A quick jerk on the leash helps switch this lateral gait into a diagonal trot and usually improves the top line. Function determines form. The dachshund's low chest line creates a keel on which to rest and frees the elbows for digging. It also lends a convenient shoehorn effect for sliding backwards out of burrows. This doxy has good flexion in her stifles and hocks, coordinated with free action in front. Here is an inside look at her shoulder assembly and forelegs through cineradiography. As we showed you earlier, these pictures were made by fluoroscoping and photographing the dog as she moved on a treadmill. What many of us fail to realize is the great mobility of the shoulder blades as they swing from their upper rims. Their movement is indicated here by the dark lines of the scapular spines that run up the centers of the blades. The withers are those shadowy bones rising from the individual vertebrae to which the shoulders are attached only by muscle. Typical of the whippet is the well-inclined croup and low tail set. A variety like the Lakeland Terrier has a more level top line and short, flat croup. Though one feature may influence the other, the slope of the croup and angle of the pelvis are not one and the same. The pleasing top line of this Doberman Pinscher is due to his overall symmetry of proportion and a strong neck that blends gradually into the withers. Correct elbow placement and desirable breadth across the front and rear quarters indicate good length of major bones that are the foundation of a dog's framework. Toothpaste worked quite well on this shiny coat to suggest these bones and the angles where they meet. 
In determining angulation on the live dog, there can be no precise measurement. Muscles are never stable, and judgment can vary on the points of reference used in the measuring. In general, however, when a dog is standing naturally, good reference points in assessing structural balance are the shoulder and stifle joints, which should have similar angulation. This dog's excellent conformation creates a broad base of support beneath both front and rear quarters. He trots with ease and good foot timing as the forepaws lift just ahead of the oncoming hindpaws. By contrast, this red Doberman lacks balance because she has more angulation behind than in front, and she looks leggy. At the base of her neck, there is an abrupt juncture with flat withers. The rib cage does not extend well back and the coupling looks weak. The steeply set shoulders and upper arms reduce breadth across the forequarters, narrowing the base of support in contrast to the rear. As a result, front mobility is restricted and thrust from the more angulated rear forces the forelimbs into full extension too high above the ground. This upsets the rhythm of footfall and causes overreaching, where the hind feet overstep the front. To avoid such interference, she often paces like this. Upward flipping of the pads to delay footfall, called padding, is another compensation for a front that is out of balance with the rear. The good head carriage, strong working back, and correct tail set contribute to the beautiful top line of this Irish wolfhound. As rear thrust is transmitted smoothly through the stifles, loins, and central body, it is counterbalanced by the cushioning effect of the forelimbs. Watch the shoulders and thighs. There is no jarring in any part. He is a picture of symmetry and coordination. A firm working back is essential for staying power, as shown by this Norwegian elk hound at work. The steep, narrow rear of the elk hound on the left contrasts with the better hindquarters of the dog on the right, whose moderate angulation is correct. We will see the left dog moving with stilted action and severe rolling across the loins as the hips compensate for what could be weakness in the stifles. Overreaching can be seen from the side, but becomes more obvious as he moves away with the limbs moving on a bias to the line of travel. Called crabbing, this term comes from the sea crab that moves in sidewise fashion. Other reasons for crabbing may be due to proportion, muscular strain, spinal injury, habit, or bad handling. Heart and willingness often take a dog farther than physical structure would indicate. Here, a 12-year-old Dalmatian just recovering from surgery refuses to let this horse and cart leave without him. There are certain limitations to assessing a dog on a lead line as opposed to when he is playing his natural role. See how the tight leash pulls up the front and spoils the trotting rhythm of this fine dog. The same thing happens here until the handler loosens the lead. This Irish setter lacks angulation equally in both ends. So it may be said that he is in balance, but his stride is short and bouncy. 
and he will lack the style, drive, and animation such as this dog has. Notice the loose lead. Of ancient lineage, the Chow is characteristically straighter in the hock than most other breeds, but this trait should not be exaggerated. Though showing a roll due to heavy coat and loose skin, this pup moves well with the hindquarters doing their share of the work. A serious deformity in any breed is hyperextension of the hock. The joint is loose and tends to bend the wrong way. As with many other faults, this crippling problem tends to be inherited. Horsemen often say that the hock is the most important joint in the animal's body. The stiff hocks of this little Maltese kick high rather than driving forward. Stiff hocks that lack flexion are called sickle hocks. The term comes from the farm tool that has a rigid joint where the handle meets the blade. The faulty sickle hocks of these tiny chihuahuas allow no backswing of the lower legs. The stifle joints are also stiff as roached backs and padding fronts compound the problem. No breed, large or small, is exempt from sickle hocks. Here is another example. By contrast, this Kerry Blue Terrier exhibits strong forward drive through flexible joints that contribute to his smooth, lively trot. The German Shepherd Dog's sickle-like stance is not a fault as long as the rear joints open and close freely. Good drive helps any young man catch up with the lady of his choice. There she is. What a tasty dish. There's a vivid contrast between the conformation of this fox terrier and this one. Measured from ground to highest point of the withers and from forechest to ischium, or rearmost point of the pelvis, both dogs are rather squarely built, but the one on the left looks longer in the back. Technically speaking, the term back refers to the mid-top line where the thoracic and lumbar vertebrae meet. In dog language, however, back generally means the distance between the highest point of the withers and the hip bones. Qualities that shorten and strengthen the back of this terrier are the pleasing neckline and properly inclined shoulders, the good rib cage, short coupling, and good breadth across the hindquarters. Characteristically, the forelegs stand in line with the undersurface of the neck, a feature that sets the elbows forward along the chest wall and contributes to the breed's short, brisk gait. The faulty long back shown here is due to upright shoulders which make the neck appear short. The rib cage does not extend well back, the coupling is slack, and the rear quarters are steep and narrow. Altogether, these failings leave too much distance between the base of the neck and the hip bones, weakening the overall top line. Another small but significant point of comparison is the ischium which on the more correctly built terrier on the right projects well behind the insertion of the tail. This indicates more length to the pelvic bone and therefore better muscling in the croup. Compare this feature with the terrier on the left. The ischium is not as visible because the pelvis is shorter and more steeply set, indicating less desirable hindquarters.
In a close contest at a dog show, a judge was heard to say, I like this one better because he has more behind the tail. A lot said in a very few words. This Afghan is taller than he is long, perhaps because he is still a puppy. The front is acceptable, but his back appears stiff and the rear assembly is steep. He hunches when he trots. This increases the problem of overreaching and reduces drive. Notice the crabbing. It is easier and more comfortable for him to pace. If we saw this hound in the show ring, we could easily conclude that he would not be an efficient galloper in the field. In coursing or racing dogs, such as these greyhounds, flexible backs are essential for great speed, with muscular rear quarters to exert lift and thrust. Strong pastons with kinetic spring are also critical for optimum performance. Whatever a dog's purpose, Willingness and good attitude make for effective teamwork. For a flying start, length of ear may help. This Irish Water Spaniel has quite a role due to his heavy coat, but underneath he's all business. His strong front assembly helps him to carry objects with ease. A truly great dog is a combination of skeletal, muscular, and mental coordination. This treeing walker hound has convinced his owner there's a raccoon in that tree. and shows him where. Within this remarkable and complex machine, each muscle is consistent in its origin and insertion, regardless of the dog's size or shape, and each has its special function. Some we can feel with our fingers, but to visualize what takes place, we need to understand something about how the major muscles work. We'll discuss a few. First, watch the play of muscles in this fine Rhodesian Ridgeback. Thrust and spring is transmitted smoothly through her firm central body into the shoulders. The outline at the base of a dog's neck is created chiefly by the trapezius muscles that flow forward over the cervical or neck vertebrae and rearward over the thoracic. These muscles anchor along each side of the scapular ridge and hold the blades within the anatomical boundaries fixed by the shape of the chest. Their function is to lift and flex the shoulders. Like this. Inside, between the upper blades, the sheet-like rhomboidius muscle works with the trapezius to activate the blades and draw them in toward the withers. The serratus ventralis muscle serves as a fibrous sling between the shoulders and surface of the ribs. It is often called the hang muscle because it helps carry the trunk and has much to do with smooth movement. Along the lower chest, the pectoral muscles stretch from sternum to the humerus. The pectorals help lift the trunk, extend the shoulder joints, and pull the limbs in and back. 
they can be seen on this visla. Since the dog has no collarbone and the scapula is attached to the chest only by muscle, nature has given extra prominence to the acromion process, a bony tubercle at the lower end of the scapular spine. This provides more room for heavy muscling needed to control movement of the shoulder joint. Moving x-rays show what happens inside. Incidentally, the white tube in the background is the trachea, or windpipe. The latissimus dorsi muscles that fan up along the sides of the rib cage help pull the trunk forward. They also help draw the limbs in against the trunk as well as rearward with flexion of the shoulder joints. Look closely at the lean rib cage of this ridgeback and try to visualize the muscle action. Thrust from powerful rear muscles is transmitted through the longissimus muscles that interconnect along the spine. These contribute to this dog's tireless elastic movement. Firm muscling and good structure enable this incredible machine to perform well. Poor condition and faulty conformation are basic to the problems of this Vimarana. Her weak muscles let the trunk slump between the steeply set shoulders. This creates a rough juncture at the withers and the neck appears short. In comparison with her upright scapula, there is an exaggerated rearward slope to the humerus which makes her set over herself in front, and the elbows will consequently swing out of line when she moves. The dip in her mid-top line is accentuated by the rib cage that is proportionately too short and the coupling that is long and weak. Notice the loose up and down action at the tips of the blades and the bouncing and twisting through the back. The twisting hocks and rocking haunches made me suspicious that she had hip dysplasia, but I was wrong. At two years of age, her hips were x-rayed as normal. It would appear that her poor rear action was compensation for the more serious trouble in front. When this dog was a puppy, her structural shortcomings were as obvious then as later. A good moving pup may go bad for reasons of illness or injury, but a bad mover seldom improves. Here is another example of loose shoulders and awkward movement. Center radiography shows how the blades swivel and cross, and the chest sags low within the pectoral girdle. As we move down the front, we see the upper arms, the elbows, the radius and ulna of the forearms, and the carpal or paston joints, which help to absorb impact with the ground. In the rear, notice how the femoral heads move in the hip sockets. The hock joint 
consists of several small bones and should not be confused with the rear pasterns. For endurance in herding, dogs need not only strong hindquarters, but very flexible front assemblies for crouching and split-second turning. Because of the nature of their work, the blade tips can often be felt slightly above the withers even when standing, not to be mistaken for loose or badly positioned shoulders. This Shelty's back is long and weak, a fault that causes bouncing when she trots. An inside look reveals blades that are rather steeply set, but nevertheless quite firmly knit. Notice how they swing from the top of the withers with minimal swiveling. However, the lumbar span sags giving reason for the up-and-down motion. The slight upward tilt of the spine where it joins the sacrum contributes to the two-flat croup and poor tail set. Red lines in the diagram show this faulty relationship. By contrast, the back of this Sheltie is roached. Her chest tips downward, creating an imbalance between shoulders that set too upright and upper arms that slope too much. These features contribute to faulty hackney action and lack of rhythm. When galloping, she looks quite like a fox. This beautiful pup sets into himself nicely. The strong neck blends into the withers, telling of well-placed shoulders, and there is correct relationship with the upper arms. Note the good top line and strong hindquarters. He trots with ease, spring, and good foot placement. When choosing a puppy, keep an eye on those that trot freely with minimum twist to the body. An X-ray of the front assembly of a well-built collie, taken from the side as she stood naturally, gives an inside look that reveals the kind of relationship between scapular and humerus that contributes to efficient ground-covering action. Measured up the scapular spine off the vertical, the shoulders rest within a normal range of 25 to 30 degrees, and the shoulder joint set correctly just rearward of the forechest which gives the assembly good support of the rib cage. Nature does not call for more angulation. The subject of this X-ray illustrates how such an arrangement provides maximum mobility when coordinated with good stride from behind. The secret is structural balance and good physical condition. In this diagram, one line shows a workable 30-degree setting of the shoulder blade in comparison with a line indicating an untenable slope of 45 degrees. Hypothetically, the latter angle would place the shoulder joint in front of the manubrium where support of the chest wall would be lacking and standing support weakened. Furthermore, starting from such a position, any lift and inward swing of the assembly would cause the inner shoulder muscles to interfere with the cervical structure. In this cineradiography, notice the swing of the blades and how close the joints come to the neck. Our subject here was a Ken Terrier whose standing x-ray showed an approximate 30-degree layback. Her stride appears a little uneven,
probably because of uneasiness as she trotted on the treadmill. Since there can be no clinical accuracy in measuring bones and angles on the live dog, it would seem far wiser to judge the quality of structure in terms of mobility rather than figures. Well, we've looked at structure and gait from the side. Now let's take a look at dogs as they come and go. This Bichon Frise came And then he went. Viewed from front or rear, a dog with normal structure should stand with relatively straight columns of support from hips through stifles and hock joints, and from shoulder joints through elbows and pasterns. The toes face out very slightly for balance, much as a human stands with the feet not quite parallel. But the tendency should not be exaggerated. The gait of any dog is influenced by natural laws that facilitate forward motion with minimum effort. This means that as speed increases, the limbs tend to converge to centralized support and minimize the shifting of weight from side to side. Going away, this great Pyrenees moves correctly with no leg interference in spite of his floppy dew claws. But coming toward us, he toes in a bit a minor fault in view of his overall quality. Broad and deep-chested, the Bull Terrier has a wider footfall than many breeds, but the limbs still draw in slightly to offset body roll. This single-tracking Belgian Sheepdog demonstrates the breed's unique tendency to move in a circle because of his herding instinct. Gait is related to the purpose for which different varieties of dogs were developed. So it isn't how much or how little the limbs converge that is important. It is knowing why it happens. Structure of the hindquarters is perhaps more readily understood than the front because the rear joints are easier to see and feel, whereas the bones of the fore assembly seem more deeply seated in muscles and the mechanics of movement more complex. One of the basic factors influencing front action is shape of the chest, against which the shoulders rest in a three-dimensional position. They slant up and back, they slant in toward the withers, and because they lie against the tapering portion of the rib cage, they face slightly inward, not parallel to the spine. Thus, movement is directed centrally as muscles draw the limbs toward a midline of travel. See how shoulder joint action is highlighted beneath the coat of this lovely collie, as strong hips and stifles contribute to smooth action in the rear. A dorsoventral view of a fox terrier galloping on a treadmill shows the shoulder blades gliding over the narrowing part of the chest. Notice how the ribs move back and forth with pull of the muscles, and how the heart has room to move within the chest cavity. Look closely at the good stance of this Samoyed and the equally good stance of this German Shepherd. How a dog stands gives some indication of how he will move. As we have said previously, the pastern should be relatively straight when viewed from the front, with the middle toes slightly off-center for balance. As the dog moves and the limbs swing inward, normal flexion of the pasterns prevents interference with the supporting legs. And just before full extension, a slight rotation lets the feet land squarely with the central toes taking the thrust as weight passes over the forelimbs. Watch the way this fine Samoyed places his feet.
posing a dog unnaturally with the central toes dead ahead by twisting the elbows out, does the dog a disservice. Because if he stood this way on his own, the feet would land on the outer pads and he would pin toe or toe in like this. As a young dog, this ridgeback always followed when his mistress was horseback riding. But as he grew older, joint discomfort developed and he preferred to stay home. Unsound structure subjects joints to uneven pressure that causes wear and tear on cartilage and bones. This dog's poor front is obvious even as he moves away. However, the rear action is good. Exceptions to what is considered normal structure are varieties whose shoulder assemblies have to wrap around unusually broad rib cages. Their proportionately short front legs tend to bow in because the carpal joints set closer than the elbows, resulting in a conspicuous turning out of the feet to counterbalance the upper structure. Heavy muscling on the outer forearms may exaggerate this feature. As well as a good front, this Basset has excellent hindquarters with direct thrust through the hocks and stifles. He has a beautiful top line and strong central body. Low to the ground with seemingly no straight lines, the Dandy Dinmond is a rugged little terrier. This subject also moves well. This fox terrier moves stiffly because of a steep front assembly and sickle hocks. Inward swing of the limbs is restricted and the footfall is too wide. Parallel action like this is often caused by a tight lead. Since we rarely, if ever, have perfection and judging is comparative, this subject would be considered the better of the two because he moves more freely. In this diagram, he is outlined on the right. And he moves better as he comes toward us. Good conformation and free movement are essential for top quality. Viewed from any angle, this handsome Scottish Terrier moves well. But too much freedom can cause rolling and paddling. This Great Dane has an impressive stance but her upper arms and elbows take side trips as she comes toward us, making the paws land on the outer pads and twist. The severe elbowing out of this German shorthead pointer would greatly reduce stamina in the field. Twisting pasterns called winging and weak hocks seriously impaired this dog's usefulness. Shown in harness as the right wheel dog, he strains to the side, in contrast to the straighter pull of his teammate on the left. Flat, splayed feet are due to weak knuckles and unusually thin pads, subjecting the paws to injury and strain. Carpal joints that break inward too much weaken limb support. The shallow chest and tight elbows are basic to this dog's gating problem. Pasterns that give too much place undue strain on tendons and ligaments. There is no spring in the gait of this Kuvats and action is labored. But when you are in the show ring, your dog may gain favor if he smiles at the judge. 
Sound structure is essential for continued ease in jumping. The strong pasterns of this seven-year-old Catahoula cattle dog help lift the front just before push-off from the rear. His back folds as he clears the bar, then stretches as the limbs extend in a gradual landing angle. There are many kinds of jumping styles. This enthusiast gives herself an extra shove so that all four feet will share the impact on landing. The awkward bunny hopping takeoff of this Tavurin, his rigid back and strain on the shoulders indicate something wrong physically. By contrast, watch the jumping ability of this youngster. What a show off. Though horses are built differently from dogs, many similar terms are used to describe structure and ways of moving. Hackneying, for example, is a highly stylized gait for which certain strains of horses have been developed. The elevated head carriage and sloping shoulders give lift and bend to the forelimbs as lively hock action lends elegance to the overall effect. The alert little miniature pincher is one of the toy breeds calling for animated hackney-like action. Here is a different min pen that has an incorrect paddling or goose-stepping stride due to a steep front assembly and sickle hocks. Her faulty action is even more evident as she approaches, and she definitely resents criticism. In a quite different sense, the term hackneying refers to faulty action when a dog with a steep fore assembly resorts to exaggerated lift and bend of the front limbs to delay and minimize interference with the longer strides of a more angulated rear. And this throws the gait out of rhythm. The striking phase of the front paw is not coordinated with the expended thrust from the rear paw on the same side, and diagonal action is also irregular. Smooth, ground-covering movement with no wasted effort is what we are looking for. Coursing hounds that trot with ease are usually smooth gallopers. whereas awkwardness in trotting and stiff backs contribute to excessive up-and-down motion. This dog's narrow, shallow chest and poorly developed pectoral muscles affect placement of the elbows, called tied elbows, and seriously restricts front action. Her lack of elbow flexion makes the forelimbs fling wide in extreme paddling and the shoulders rock from side to side. A flat-coated retriever exhibits the same problem. This dog has sound conformation which is necessary for staying power, whether working a field or pulling a load. But an unsound dog, such as this one, would lack the strength and endurance to work over a long period of time. The fault of crossing slackens speed and wastes energy. Improper handling may create problems that are not there, but that is not the reason for this Afghan's crossing and brushing. Twisting and tumbling should never be confused with the old English sheepdog's natural tendency to move with a slight roll. This breed is rather squarely built, usually a trifle lower at the shoulders than at the loins. The rear quarters are broad, heavily muscled with low-set hocks, features that contribute to a slow, tireless amble when driving herds to market. However, he should be able to trot freely like this, showing a moderate, almost forward roll as the legs shift from one diagonal to the other, made more evident by the heavy coat. 
His galloping style is vividly described as elastic. Coat behavior can be a clue as to what really goes on beneath. Here, a 12-year-old pulley trots with minimum flounce signifying good structure. But to tell whether he's going or coming, it may help to look for the tongue. Did you really think there was only one dog under all that coat? When rear action is correct, the limbs swing smoothly with no twisting. Moving close is a fault where the hocks turn in, making the rear pastons move parallel to one another. This weakens the line of support and reduces drive. Notice how this dog's thighs jerk. The cause may rest in any or all of the rear joints. Little dogs with short legs and wide rumps have more waggle than many varieties. However, comparing these two corgis, the one on the right has excessive twist because she too is moving close. The hocks break inward, indicating possible trouble in the stifle joints. A more serious hindrance to efficient gating can be the fault of cowhocks where the lower legs turn out, clearly illustrated by this attractive little mongrel. This cowhocked otterhound looks most uncomfortable. Note the pounding action in his rump. Close kin to sickle hocks are spread or barrel hocks, where the hocks twist out and cause towing in or even crossing. This kind of action may also stem from trouble in the stifles, which twist in as the hocks twist out. Landing heavily on the forelegs is called pounding, and in time the shoulders may become overly muscled because the front must compensate for weakness in the rear quarters. Note the low head carriage and lack of drive. Here the trouble is hip dysplasia. Looking from underneath, this diagram shows an imperfect fit between the femoral heads and the hip sockets. An arrow points to the site of the problem. Such a condition creates irregular pressure points and causes varying degrees of discomfort. Moving x-rays, also from underneath, from which the preceding diagram was drawn, show how such malformation causes the femoral heads to pull away from the base of the sockets. To determine whether or not hip dysplasia is present, a carefully positioned x-ray is the only sure answer. The disease occurs in varying degrees of severity. This x-ray shows pronounced hip dysplasia with joint laxity and subluxation of the femoral heads. Even more severe is the crippling malformation seen here, where the badly deformed femoral heads are outside the flattened hip sockets. Though environment may play a part in the presence of hip dysplasia, heredity is considered to be a major cause. The subject of this x-ray was considered to have excellent hip formation, with normally shaped femoral heads seated deeply in the hip sockets. Turning our attention to the bottom of the frame, we see the lower ends of the femurs, or thigh bones, where the patellas, or kneecaps, are situated correctly in the trochlear grooves. The patellas play a crucial role in the stability and movement of the stifle joints or knees. Any tendency of these little bones to slip from one side or the other is called patella luxation, and gating irregularities ensue. An indication of the problem is when a dog may resist flexing the stifle joints by swinging the legs outward. 
as in the case of this cairn terrier. In this diagram, drawn from his x-ray, red dots in the right drawing show how the patellas have slipped to the outside of the trochlea grooves. In the left drawing, red dots indicate normal placement of the patellas. Here is the x-ray of this cairn terrier. Note that though the patellas are displaced, the hips are normal. Watch the strong stifle action of this fine-moving Doberman. The drive is straight ahead with no twisting. An inside look at this joint shows how the lower femur and upper tibia seem to roll against each other as the patella provides a smooth bearing surface for tendons and ligaments. As simple as it may appear, the stifle is a complex joint and very vulnerable to strain or injury. But abnormalities also tend to be inherited. Here is another illustration of something amiss. X-ray showed the problem was not hip dysplasia. As this setter walks slowly around the observer, notice how the joints twist with occasional reluctance to bear full weight. Whatever the cause, the problem appears to rest in the stifles. The skipping action of this pretty Lhasa Apso is another symptom of patella luxation. This Irish setter puppy is one that I followed through to adulthood. At the age of eight weeks, the elbows looked too prominent and he stood quite cowhot. Both features became more obvious when he gated. The flaws in this puppy were still apparent at the age of nine months. The hocks twist badly, the stifles are weak, and the upper quarters pitch from side to side. In any breed, smooth, coordinated movement is what we hope to achieve through carefully planned breeding programs. We can't deny that expression, personality, color, texture, and size give every breed its special appeal and add to the pleasure of the owner. But these traits alone are not enough. Sound structure and reliable temperament are vitally important if a strain is to be kept strong. We may be looking for a pup to serve a special role, or we may want just a trustworthy family companion. In any case, we should turn to the breeders who know what to look for and what to avoid. In this way, we can increase the chances of selecting a puppy that will be not only a credit to his owner, but what is more important, a credit to his own breed. For centuries, sages have written of the dog's loyalty and usefulness to man. Dogs that have given so much in return for so little. This is a heritage that we should always cherish, and one that we should try to preserve as carefully as possible for the countless generations to come. Thank you.